on your screen. You'll see, find information on today's speakers, links to relevant documents, websites, and much more. Thank you to our webinar sponsor, LiftMaster. And it's my pleasure to present to you today's speakers. Sally Pelto-Wheeler is the Program Coordinator for the National Playground Maintenance Technician Training at the Epley Institute for Parks and Public Lands at Indiana University. With a master's degree in public health, Sally has experience with multidisciplinary work and an understanding of the importance in prevention and health safety. She is especially passionate about the impact of parks, recreation, and green space on community health. Kelly Richardson is a co-founder and senior partner of Richardson Ober PC, a leading advocate for homeowner association governance. Kelly was CAI's 2016 national president and served on the board of trustees for seven years. He was in 2006 admitted as a fellow to the College of Community Association Lawyers. He is the author of a syndicated weekly column on homeowner association issues, appearing in 13 Southern California newspapers. A licensed real estate broker, he has served on the boards of California Legislative Action Committee, the Greater Los Angeles Chapter, and the Orange County Chapter. He has practiced law since 1983 and community association law in 1989. We'll start out with a poll. Question one, what is your involvement in a common interest community? Manager, board member, property owner, lawyer, non-lawyer service provider, or other? Go ahead and select that. And question two, how often do you perform and document inspections on your playgrounds? Weekly, monthly, every six months or more, or never? I'll give you a moment to finish that. Looks like uh, the vast majority of our people here are managers with some other uh, board member represented here. And the uh, performing and documenting inspections on playgrounds looks to be every six months or more, or monthly, or never. And the audience is yours. Well, thank you. And welcome, everybody, to our presentation. Uh, this story uh, really was kicked off uh, last month uh, in the state of Nevada at a delightful association called the Lamplight Village uh, uh, at, I think, Centennial Springs in Las Vegas. That association uh, consists of just under 300 homes and had a very nice uh, tot lot or, or park, as you can see in the photograph in the lower right of your screen. Uh, but their association had a swing set uh, as part of its uh, equipment uh, for children to play in and uh, to enjoy, and, and in this picture, you actually see what's left of the, the swing set. Um, the, the difficulty here is that this association had, uh, over the a period of, d depending on who you listen to, maybe eight to 10 years, the swing set had had a crossbar failure that had happened, uh, I guess, four times. And uh, they had two different swing set manufacturers uh, one failed before 2009, then they had one that failed, I guess, in 2009, it was reported. And then in about 2010, they changed swing set manufacturers, bought a different swing set, and uh, that failed within, according to the plaintiff's attorney in the case, uh, failed within about nine months. Uh, the crossbar failed. Uh, they had a second, uh, well, a fourth swing set, I guess, installed in 2010 or 2011. And about three years later, uh, unfortunately, a 15-year-old boy by the last name of Thompson sat on one of the swings to send a text message. His girlfriend uh, lived uh, in the community with her mother in Lamplight Village. And as he sat there, the crossbar fell directly on his head. The crossbar... Uh, weighed, uh, here's the photograph of the swing set with the crossbar missing. That's the 42-pounder uh, that uh, hit the young man on the head. Here's a shot of the end of the crossbar where uh, it had deteriorated to a point in about three years where it uh, struck him on the head and uh, caused apparently lifelong uh, brain injury problems. Of course, uh, that turned into a lawsuit 
in the lawsuit. The uh, homeowners association's explanation uh, was that, well, the, the, the playground set was pretty new, and uh, we, didn't, uh, we knew that we could have a monthly inspection, but that really didn't seem necessary yet. The plaintiff side of the story was, of course, how could you uh, when you knew that you'd had three other playground uh, equipment failures in your association. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, in late February, a jury in Las Vegas found that the association was liable to Mr. Thompson for $20 million, $10 million of compensatory damages. Uh, I am told by the plaintiff's attorney that um, he had about $750,000 out-of-pocket damages from 2015 and, uh, uh, 2013 until the point of trial in February. And they awarded another, uh, uh, to get to the $10 million, about $9.25 million for future medical and pain and suffering. They awarded $10 million against the association for punitive damages, resulting in that total verdict of $20 million. Uh, I did have the uh, opportunity to speak with both the plaintiff trial attorney as well as the association's uh, general legal counsel. I was not able to speak with the uh, insurance company appointed lawyer that defended the association in the trial. One of the unfortunate uh, things about this, to say the least, is that the association only had $2 million liability insurance coverage. And uh, we fully expect that uh, there will be further discussions between both plaintiff lawyer and the association and the association's insurance company because of a dispute regarding whether or not the insurance company should have taken settlement offers before the trial even started. The plaintiff lawyers claimed in the media that uh, he made four or five settlement offers prior to the beginning of trial, all of which were within the insurance policy limits. So really, uh, we call this sort of the perfect storm for an association in terms of uh, about as much of a nightmare as anybody could ever have the bad fortune to dream. The association um, members, as you might imagine, uh, they're in social media. They've, they've all been struggling and trying to deal with this. And that story is not yet completely written. So that really uh, sparked this seminar as we wanted to examine with you not really just the story of this case, which is certainly attention-grabbing, but more importantly, how do the rest of us handle this and are there things that we can do to prevent a Lamplight Village disaster from happening to all of us? So with that, uh, I will uh, happily turn it over to my colleague, Sally. Hi, again, this is Sally Pelta-Wheeler, and I'm with the Epley Institute for Parks and Public Lands, and I manage the National Playground Safety Maintenance Technician Program. Just wanted to thank the Community Associations Institute again for having Kelly and I um, here today on, on this webinar. <clears throat> so the remainder of the webinar, um, as Kelly said, we really want to focus on um, what playground inspection and maintenance resources are out there for you all to utilize. Um, we want to really understand the importance of having a comprehensive inspection and a maintenance program in place. And um, finally, kind of talk about what are the basics of hazard prevention on playgrounds. So what are some of those tools that you can start using? We'll start with the resources that are available um, <clears throat> to you all um, today. Um, we have the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, or the CPSC, is charged with uh, protecting the public from unreasonable risks of injury or death associated with the use of all types of consumer products. And lucky, luckily for us, um, playground equipment falls under their jurisdiction. Uh, they have a lot of um, safety guides and safety alerts related to playgrounds. Um, and if you look in your resources and web links um, section on this webinar on the screen, you can click on these resources that I'm talking about and um, visit their websites to find out more information. There is um, the one that I link to is a, a playground safety checklist. And it's 10 of the most simple steps that you can take to help make your playground safer um, tomorrow. <clears throat> Digging a little bit deeper, 
the American Society for Testing and Materials, or the ASTM, has standards around playground equipment focusing on uh, reducing life-threatening and debilitating injuries. And you can obtain um, certain documents. Um, one that is particularly helpful would be the standard consumer safety performance specification for playground equipment for public use. And that's available right on their website for $80. And it's um, an extremely valuable resource um, for you with your playgrounds. Another kind of amazing resource that we always talk about in our program is um, to utilize the equipment manufacturers and installers of your play equipment. Um, all of your play equipment comes with manufacturer recommendations. Keep that documentation and keep their contact information handy so that you can always reach out to them um, for, with questions that you have as, as maintenance issues come up. Um, installers should really be uh, a resource for you. You pay a lot of money for, um, for them to install equipment on your properties, and you should really you know, pick their brain while they're there um, installing uh, equipment or uh, making repairs on your playground. So what is available in terms of playground training? There's really some great comprehensive programs out there available for playground um, caretakers and maintainers. The playground maintenance technician training run by the Epley Institute, for which I am the program coordinator, is um, it's a two-day program and it's in person that really focuses on the practical playground maintenance techniques, um, inspection principles, best practices in making repairs. It does not focus on kind of the, the memorizing of the standards, but rather the um, course explores the maintenance challenges associated with the common materials found on playgrounds. So things like how do you take care of concrete, metal equipment, wood equipment, plastics, the different fasteners that are all over your play equipment. The program is made to be um, interactive with case studies and videos, and you really learn about the best practices and inspections, um, how to repair damaged equipment, and it has um, a basic module as well on the legal considerations around uh, play, playground care. The second one I have listed there is the Certified Playground Safety Inspector, or the CPSI, and that's run through the National Recreation and Park Association. And it provides training on uh, playground safety issues, so that includes hazard ID, um, equipment specifications, surfacing requirements, and some risk management methods. This program is very heavy on understanding and knowing the standards around creating your standard of care on your playground. Uh, with the CPSI, there are exam and recertification requirements, so that is something to consider. The third item here on the list is the Recreation Installation Specialist Certification. And I wanted to mention this because um, <clears throat> What that is, is it's a great training to look for in your installers. If your installers have been certified in the RISC program, the RISC training, um, you know that they have some very specific training that helps them install your playgrounds correctly and to national standards and specifications. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to know if, if there's any question about whether or not you should send, you know, uh, your folks, your employees to a, the, the playground maintenance technician program or the certified playground safety inspector program. Um, there's really a little bit of overlap in the two programs, but both of them are very comprehensive in that the PMT focuses more on the maintaining side and the CPSI focuses on setting that standard of care. So if you're trying to decide what's right for you or right for your folks at your association, the PMT is for frontline staff, um, the ones that are on the playground every day performing maintenance, repairs, cleanup around the playground. Um, they're the people who are going to help you maintain the standard of care 
whereas the CPSI are more for the people who perform audits and maybe some of those low-frequency inspections or the comprehensive type inspections um, that these folks are really kind of setting your standard of care. And the PMT can then maintain that. So that's kind of the difference between those two programs. Lastly, I wanted to just cover there are individual trainings um, through manufacturers or some installers that um, they offer playground trainings. Usually they're, um, they <clears throat> are a short training between two and four hours and um, maybe around a lunch time. Maybe you can get out on the playground with them, ask them some questions. These trainings are typically very specific to the equipment that the manufacturers are selling. So that's just something to consider. <clears throat> the item that Kelly and I really want to drive home is um, what we want you to understand is that playground maintenance is it's critical to the proper functioning and the life of your equipment. 40% um, of injuries on playgrounds are due to improper, inadequate, or lack of maintenance on the equipment itself. And in some states, it's actually the law to have your playgrounds inspected by certified playground safety inspectors. Um, <clears throat> for instance, California, and Kelly might touch on that later, that um, you always want to um, make sure that you're referring to your CPSC guidelines, your ASTM standards, and your recommendations um, by your manufacturer of your equipment. The, the frontline staff um, that are out there on the playgrounds every day can be the difference of life, life and death or serious injury. So for the guy or gal who is mowing the lawn, um, who comes upon a, a jump rope, say, tied and hanging from a piece of equipment, um, the removal of that jump rope could save a kid's life. And it's really that simple. Um, knowing what to look for, really looking at um, what are the hazards on that on the playgrounds, and um, I'll I'll note more of these hazards later on in today's webinar. Um, by establishing these practices, these inspection and maintenance practices, and following it to the best of your ability, your association is less apt to be liable. And I think that that's what we want to drive home today. That. Um, throughout these practices, um, you will be less liable if you, um, you follow those practices that you have put in place for your associations. Sally, I was curious, in California, of course, uh, we have a statute that is referenced in one of the materials that we've attached here under print resources in, in your screen for the attendees. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have in, our, in this state is a requirement that play sets be inspected by a CPSI uh, certified person. Uh, yeah. Do we find those? Is there a, like a website with a roster? How, how, how does somebody find the right person to do these inspections? Yeah, actually, there uh, through the uh, National Recreation and Park Association, you can find inspectors in your state. So um, on, on the link in the resource section, there, the NRPA has that there. Um, um, and you can search. I think they're all named by their name um, and their certification status. Yes. Great. Thank you. I, we, the, sometimes it, I know it seems, folks, like uh, everybody's responsible for everything. And, and it's really not true. Um, there, there, there are two basic ways in our legal system that people acquire responsibility to someone else. One is obviously by making a contract. Uh, I agree to sell you a car for, for $10,000. You owe me 10000 I owe you a car because we have a contractual arrangement between us. Uh, covenants recorded on the property create essentially a contract between all of the owners in that community. And so responsibilities, legal obligations arise from there. But in this seminar, we're talking really about tort obligations uh, and, and, and tort liability. The, the, the law will impose responsibility on somebody who has no legal relationship with somebody else if it can be shown that one party didn't behave reasonably. We use the word due care. And the lack of due care we call negligence. And if the lack of due care results in somebody 
being hurt and that somebody being the kind of person that would foreseeably be hurt by that lack of reasonable care, then we impose liability in the absence of any other relationship on that person who's careless. And, 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 and that's really what we're talking about here. Yes, I understand there could be a CCNRs on communities that require certain maintenance standards or, or uh, uh, that talk about uh, common area equipment, but most likely most of these associations of you attending uh, on this uh, seminar don't. So in, in the tort world, uh, this really starts with knowledge. Uh, if you do not have knowledge of a dangerous condition, then that is one defense on liability for that condition. So it, it begins with, did we know there was a dangerous condition? However, if you aren't reasonably diligent in managing your property, and the reason you don't know about the dangerous condition is because you haven't been reasonably diligent in inspecting the property, then you, that itself can be considered negligence. So, for example, back in college, I worked in the supermarkets as, as a retail clerk. Uh, we had, uh, there was always an employee uh, that, that had to every hour sign a log that said they had walked the entire store and inspected the entire floor every single hour. Well, why was that? Because the store wanted to show that they had been reasonably diligent in policing the floor and in grocery stores, of course, where you have water and spills and the produce department, you know, grapes on the floor, uh, we can never guarantee that the floor will always be clear and will never have any, any spots in it. But by very regularly inspecting the store, that is one defense. But if you don't even go look and somebody slips on a grape, uh, that itself, the lack of the inspection, can be considered negligence. So this really starts with having some periodic inspection. Now that period may be dictated by your consultant, uh, by the manufacturer, by a number of sources, but that's really where it begins. Now the plaintiff attorney, uh, the plaintiff trial attorney, Sean Claggett, told me last week, had the association simply had an inspection program in place, even had they not been able to discover this corroded piece of the crossbar, he said, they, they probably wouldn't even been in this lawsuit because he would have not had a case. So, so that, was, that was really the story within the story of the Lamplight Village case is not that they were a guarantor that everything on the property is absolutely safe at all times, but by not being able to prove that they were reasonably diligent in looking at the equipment and trying to make sure it was in good shape, uh, that was what the plaintiff attorney really pounced on and apparently, looking at the punitive damage award, the jury was angry enough that it, it, it felt the um, uh, lack of care was not only negligent, but was something more so that punitive damages could be awarded. So we begin with the concept of inspection. Once we have inspection, then we're put on notice. When we see a dangerous condition in the property or something that requires repair, maintenance with a swing set, maybe tightening the, the bolts and nuts, whatever that may be, then... Uh, the next step, once we have that notice, is then to show that we took reasonable action. And that reasonable action can be a complete continuum of possible responses. It really depends upon what the issue is. If, if the association learns through its inspection, or, or by the way, it could learn through a report from a homeowner or a tenant, uh, that there's something very seriously wrong with the property, whether it be a play set or a balcony railing or or a, a trip and fall hazard, it depends on what the situation is as to what the response of the association is. Now, if you know that, that a crossbar is seriously corroded, uh, you, you're, that's probably going to dictate that as soon as you know about that, you're going to do what? Well, you're going to close off the swing set immediately. You're going to put tape around it and put a sign saying, uh, dangerous, do not use, repairs pending, something like that. Um, so that action is the next thing that, that, that you'll be judged on. Now, we have a concept of reasonable diligence. So certain things obviously are so dangerous that they require pretty much immediate emergency action. Other things may not be quite as uh, substantial 
and and require at least reasonable process moving forward to resolve the problem. Of course, when you're talking about physical danger, a physical injury, seems to me the the, the quicker, the more swiftly and effic- efficiently you move towards resolution of making something safe, the better. Uh, so at each point in the process, uh, in the inspection, the notice, how you respond to the notice, how you resolve the issue that you learn about is something that, if somebody is hurt, is going to be scrutinized by a lawyer, by an expert, uh, or if it goes this far, even by, by a jury. So it, the process of, of risk management on this really absolutely begins with preventive maintenance. I think if, if we could, Sally and I stopped the seminar and we only had five minutes, uh, we would just repeat preventive maintenance about 20 times. And that, that is the concept that we're really trying to point to, is that inspections of preventative maintenance can discover things before they become a major uh, problem like these poor folks and the poor young man, Thompson, at Lamplight Village. Yeah, so um, some of you are probably um, thinking, okay, so where do I start? <laughs> I have this um, this piece of new equipment or um, aging equipment here on my property. Now what? Um, this this slide is really here to to provide an overview of what comprehensive maintenance, um, what a program might look like, and it's. Um, the basis of our playground maintenance technician program offered by Indiana University. We call this process the playground maintenance diamond of care, and it consists of four elements of, um, of best, best practices around maintenance. Um, and first off, um, at the top, you have um, knowledge, and it goes around to inspection, correction, and documentation. So first off, you want to, you have this playground installed, you want to gain all of the knowledge you can about that equipment, about your surfacing. When the installer's there, ask a whole lot of questions. Make sure that you have all of the proper paperwork and the care guidelines. Um, Look at all of the different parts of the equipment. Have somebody there who's asking questions. Maybe even ask the installer which parts wear out fastest. Um, and um, order some of those to have those on hand. Secondly, you want to make sure that you conduct regular inspections. The manufacturer will have a guidelines for inspections for you, um, and you want to take into account other things like, um, for instance, in the case um, in Las Vegas, there's a whole lot of heat out there. <laughs> so weather, um, how, how does the weather or the elements affect your equipment? Um, or maybe you have pest issues in your area like termites. Taking all of these things into consideration, um, you want to create a maintenance and inspection plan that's unique and feasible um, for the the folks who take care of your playgrounds. The third piece is the correction, and Kelly touched a little bit on this. Um, Once your plan is in place and you're regularly inspecting, you're bound to come across issues. And corrective action is either fixing that issue or making the note and getting someone who knows how to fix it. Um, Loose parts, broken panels, rusty uh, materials. When taking those um, corrective actions, it's critical that you you are careful not to create any greater hazards. And again, um, we'll be covering those hazards coming up in the upcoming slides. The last piece here is documentation, and it's really closing the loop of the diamond of care um, by documenting the issues you observe and um, the steps that you take to to make sure that you correct that. The the PMT program covers this step in detail. So what what you should do um, during your inspections, what your form should look like, and what elements help your agency be less liable um, when considering what documentation you keep on file. So this is actually a picture of a young man uh, using a skateboard to go down a piece of playground equipment. And (laughs) I think we all know that this is probably not going to end well for this kid. (laughs) Um, We we can't do much about misuse on playground equipment. And 
I just wanted to say we use this we we start off our program um, and talk about this concept that kids are meant to take risks on playgrounds. It's healthy. Playgrounds are supposed to provide a unique um, environment for um, getting. Um, physical, cognitive, and social challenges for your children. And play is obviously super valuable um, for your child's um, learning and development. So playgrounds are supposed to be places um, where kids take risk. But um, what we want you all to encourage is um, we can't eliminate risk from playgrounds, but we can minimize hazards. And that's what we're going to get into here in a second. As associations, it's important that you determine your comfort level with the potential risks associated with owning and operating specific types of playground equipment. Well, we can't, uh, we can't uh, completely ban uh, or prevent misuse. Uh, we can we can ban it, but kids are kids, and teenagers are teenagers, and and things are going to happen. Uh, you know, one of the things that I asked the plaintiff's attorney uh, uh, in this case was, well, you know, wasn't Mr. Thompson a little bit big? I mean, he was 15 year old, and I think Mr. Claggett said that the young man weighed about 150 pounds, and uh, but he told me, and and I haven't independently verified this, that the swing set was rated for something like 600 pounds. Of weight, so uh, you know, sitting on sitting on a swing, even though you're a bigger kid, uh, probably probably isn't going to be. Uh, certainly, the jury in that case didn't find it to be misuse. But there are uh, there are so many crazy ways that that typically young people or maybe adults under the influence of uh, certain beverages sometimes do silly things. And we we wished we could have included in this presentation some of the YouTube clips that we saw. We had a great time preparing for this looking at all the silly things, like the guy on the skateboard. There was so much more. But uh, uh, there are some things, as a practical matter, that we can do to at least try to prevent people from uh, misusing equipment and damaging equipment or damaging themselves. Uh, why not have, have some usage rules in the association? Usage rules, not, you know, we, have, we often have pool rules, uh, but why not have rules for use of the playground? Uh, use of the playground equipment, r rules as to how they're to be used, that a slide is to be used in a seated position and not with a skateboard or from a standing position like you're surfing. Uh, those kinds of things. Having uh, disclosures and warnings that this equipment is intended for this purpose. Is that going to prevent injury? No. Is, is it going to prevent people from, from doing silly things? No, of course not. They're still going to happen. But remember, our, our, our goal is not to prevent anything from ever happening or from anybody from ever hurting themselves. The goal is to show that we, the association, are being reasonable in our conduct. The kinds of rules, the kinds of um, standards and disclosures that we try to keep people safe, but even as sometimes plaintiff-oriented as, as our legal system seems to be these days, we still are not the guarantor of everybody's health. So um, having some type of usage rules, some types of disclosures and warnings, obviously you have to be careful to make sure that your usage rules are not inconsistent with, the, with, with what the, the manufacturer says. Uh, and an obvious other uh, thing that comes to mind is, well, then we're going to have age-related restrictions. Uh, we're going to, to say that uh, children under the age of 14 have to be accompanied at the playground by their parent. Well, one, one of the oddities about fair housing law is that that is almost certainly a violation of federal uh, fair housing laws and probably the laws in your state. I know it is in California. Uh, the, the, when we have an age-related restriction, uh, outside of senior communities. When we have an age-related restriction, uh, such as uh, children uh, can't use the uh, playground or the swimming pool unless they're accompanied by an adult or they're 14 or older, that is a dead-bang fair housing violation. Uh, there are many federal district court cases in California where landlords have been successfully sued for having a rule that children under the age of 14 must be accompanied by a parent or guardian. 
Now, those of you that live in California may be familiar that we have a state health and safety regulation that specifically requires that we post at swimming pools a, a sign that says exactly that. Children should be accompanied by uh, a parent or guardian if they're under 14. Uh, but if you enforce that age standard, you are going to violate fair housing law and be exposed to a lawsuit. So one of the things that we can't do is require that an adult be present to keep, these, keep a watch on these kids. Now, interestingly, one wonders, could you have a top-end age limit? Well, may, maybe you could have a, a limit that says adults will not be on this, or that you could have a size limit that uh, people over a certain height may not use the equipment. I think you'd probably be safe there because you're obviously not discriminating against families with children. You're actually trying to preserve it for children. But just be very, very careful. If you're going to, in your restrictions, uh, have something that, that where you're trying to have something that addresses age, uh, have your legal counsel take a real close look at it uh, because, that, that, unfortunately, fair housing laws don't allow us to protect children uh, from dangerous situations, even as extreme as the, uh, the, the, obviously the swimming pool, the playground equipment, or a, a weight room, a gymnasium where we have weights. Uh, we haven't had anybody able to ever tell us that it's safe to even have an age standard there. So just be very cautious when you're dealing uh, with that. Um, the, um, the, next, uh, the next thing is uh, spotting safety hazards. Uh, I'm wondering, how do we do that, Sally? Yeah, so what can we do? What can your employees do tomorrow? I like to make things practical for people. Um, what can we do tomorrow to, mi to minimize the risk on playgrounds? There are some common situations that arise on playgrounds that can be spotted during regular inspections, and that's why preventive maintenance is so important. Um, they include hazards like um, entanglement, head and neck entrapment, um, impacts as a result from falling um, onto surfacing, and lastly, protrusions. Nearly 80% of playground hazards are due to falls during impact, so falls to the surfacing below. So if you're really looking at reducing injuries, um, take care of your surfacing. Please, please, please take care of your surfacing. And you can look, at, um, look to the CPSC standards or the ASTM standards for those guidelines. Um, I want to cover each of these items a little bit and kind of make them real life for you. I have some images here um, that can kind of show you what a hazard looks like on the playground. Um, entanglement, um, the first item here is it's the leading cause of death or serious injury on playgrounds. It most often involves a child's clothing, um, such as a hood or a hood string or maybe a cape. Um, around the neck, uh, leading to strangulation. Things like this washer up in the right-hand corner of the slide right now, that's too large. It's too large and it can cause um, an entanglement. Or the gap on this slide, the, the picture on this slide, um, that can easily have a piece of clothing get stuck in it. Uh, or a, maybe bolts that stick out too far past um, the thread or the threads of the bolt stick out beyond the nut. These items can cause a serious hazard related to entanglement. Um, gaps, um, head and neck entrapments, um, gaps that are considered head um, entrapments on rigid equipment measure more than three and a half inches and less than nine inches. So if I go on the slide here, I'm talking about this, um, the yellow, um, arrows between the piece of wood and the, pay, the play equipment, you do not want those gaps in your equipment to be between the range of three and a half and nine, um, nine inches. That can cause head entrapment and cause serious injury. And when maintaining and repairing, make sure that you avoid creating any of those head entrapments. And actually on this slide as well, there's a yellow tool up in the right-hand corner that is actually something that is used to measure for head and neck entrapments. And um, for instance, a CPSI inspector could use that tool to, to do that. Back to this list, 
um, impact. Impact as a result from falling to surfacing. So if someone falls um, to the surfacing below um, from the play equipment, it, it can be caused by many different things. The a collapse of the equipment or loose or moving equipment that's too loose. As part of the inspection process, it's important to push and pull and use that playground equipment to check for that looseness. Um, and also check your footers and um, are they still in good shape? Are they sturdy? You, you want your surfacing, um, not the child's body, to absorb the impact of a child falling onto it. So that's really why it's called safe, safety surfacing. Um, lastly, I want to cover protrusions. It's um, a protrusion is something, it's uh, kind of self-explanatory, it's something that sticks out and can cause bodily injury to a user um, because um, it can either jab the skin or poke in an eye socket or stab an internal organ. Um, for instance, on this slide here, the yellow arrow is pointing to a bolt that is sticking far past the requirement of the only two threads past the nut. So that bolt needs to be um, cut. Um, and again, I, I just want to make sure that um, folks understand that when you're repairing or replacing equipment on your playground, you do not want to create um, any of these hazards as you're doing that. That's an important part of uh, this process, this maintenance process. And you can obviously see here in this in this slide that this equipment, um, there was a, a play, pa play equipment panel that was replaced and that bolt was put on there and it just wasn't cut. And it's as simple as that, cutting that down to um, the, the point to where there's only two threads on the end of that, that bolt. Um, there are a lot of things that um, your employees can start doing tomorrow to keep an eye out on potential hazards. And by educating them, by educating those frontline staff and equipping them with this knowledge, you can increase inspection time and make your, your playground safer actually pretty easily. So if your staff is out there um, mowing grass or picking up trash on the playground, train them. Train them to look for broken glass in that safety surfacing. Um, look for protruding bolts or metal, something that's going to harm a child. Um, keep an eye out for worn swing chains. Um, any little action to reduce hazards make playgrounds safer. And um, you're likely to decrease your liability for your association by doing so. I had an association uh I won't, won't say where for obvious reasons, in their play area, in the, the sand around their play equipment, a, a contractor, uh, I'll say allegedly, uh, left an insulin needle in the sand of the play area. And uh, sadly, a two or three-year-old wound up uh, getting punctured by the needle. And uh, uh, so the parents are upset. They have a lawyer. And, uh, you know, in, in, in working through that, that situation, that claim, when we talk about notice, uh, could the association somehow have uh, so closely inspected the sand that it would literally find a needle in a haystack? I, I, I think, I really do think there are limits. Uh, and I think even the plaintiff attorney has recognized that because he's, he's not really pushing my client anymore. He's really talking to the contractor who employed this careless worker. But I, I think, again, that, that highlights the issue that it's about notice and knowledge and reasonable awareness that would generate that knowledge. And I think the, the pictures, Sally, were super helpful in identifying uh, some, some great examples of that. And again, the, the activities in response to that, uh, some of these things, if, if it's, if it's identified, I mean, if we have that sharp bolt sticking out, you know, we may need to put some tape over that immediately. Uh, before we can even get that, get that, uh, uh, get that sawed off so that it's safe, uh, we may have to we may have to do something much much sooner. Uh, we may we may want to put some tape off just to close that particular area of the play equipment. So, uh, the great great examples of the kinds of things that we we're expected to notice. 
um, the, the, that reasonable, that liability doesn't come from the injury. It comes from somebody proving that we were not reasonably alert, reasonably vigilant in checking the property and uh, uh, at least trying to prevent those kinds of situations from happening. Another really important concept for all of, all of you volunteers uh, uh, and, the, and you managers that advise them and train your board members is the business judge rule, which I think is pretty much universal throughout the United States legal system. And that says that is, as long as your board members are acting in good faith and in the, in the best interest of the association and on reasonable inquiry diligence. Now, fortunately, in the case that started this seminar, the individual board members were not sued. The corporation was sued. But very often we see uh, lawyers looking for deeper pockets or to put additional pressure on the association, and for, for a variety of reasons they try to sue our individual directors. Well, the business judge rule has three elements to it. That's one of the articles uh, that I've also attached to this for your reference. And, and the three elements are good faith, which means you're, you're, you're trying to do the best for the association. And remember, good faith is not what you say. Good faith is what somebody else says about your conduct. And then you're acting in the best interest of the association. Uh, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're uh, 75 years old and you never go near the play area, uh, you, can't, you can't ignore the play set equipment and its maintenance and repair needs because you don't use it. You have to think of the entire association. And I think really the third element, and all three of these elements must be met to be safe, reasonable inquiry or reasonable diligence, and that really was the allegation against the Lamplight Village folks, is that they weren't reasonable in responding to the past failures and in, and, and in not having some kind of an ongoing inspection program. But the good news about the business judgment rule, at least for our volunteers, is that if they stay within the, the confines of that, then they're going to be individually protected from liability. And, and the association may still be on the hook, but the volunteers at least know that they're not going to have to hire their own attorneys to protect themselves. So that's, a, that's something that you managers, uh, you're on the front lines. You're going to be teaching uh, people about the importance of the business judgment rule, and uh, uh, which is just got to be day in and day out, something that all our volunteers really understand. Well, a couple of other uh, uh, issues as, as we move past the, the, the great tips and, and training from Sally to, well, what else can we do? Uh, I, I think there are a couple of other things that, that we can do. We've already talked about usage rules, but I, I think that the, the, uh, these days, $2 million just isn't what it used to be. And, I, and, I, and I'm just shaking my head as I even say that. Um, I'm finding more and more that $1 million doesn't seem to be enough when I'm looking at vendor contracts uh, or, or the association's insurance coverage. Check with your association insurance, bro insurance broker and see what it would cost to get excess uh, liability insurance coverage. It may not be as expensive as you think, and it is sort of a last resort type of, of protection. But you really want to keep in touch with your broker and periodically have a tune-up of your insurance and make sure that you have what your association needs and which really conforms to the uniqueness of your particular community and the unique risks of that community. Um, the uh, uh, If all else fails and you have a significant claim come in, a uh, playground injury or any other kind of, of catastrophic or major injury claim, one of the first things that I think I would really urge you to do is have monitoring counsel involved. Monitoring counsel, yes, that's going to be paid out of the association's uh, budget, uh, out of the resources. It's a non-budgeted expense, so it's going to create some financial imbalance. But don't just rely on the insurance company's appointed attorney. And uh, one, of the, one of the arguments between the association and the plaintiff and the insurance company for the association in the Lamplight Village case is going to be about the insurance company's role in all of this, and that'll be for other people to figure out who's right and who's wrong. But having monitoring counsel is somebody who is loyal only to the association, who doesn't have to answer to a claims manager, uh, somebody back in Cleveland or Chicago. Uh, they are loyal only to the association. So that, that expense of having you, your uh, association attorney monitor what's going on in the defense of that case, uh, being involved in discussions about settlement offers, 
could wind up being really, really critical for the association. The additional cost of a monitoring council really shouldn't be substantial. We're not talking about your HOA attorney uh, rewriting and co-writing all the motions and showing up at depositions, but just making sure that your general, that your the direct legal counsel for the association, what I call monitoring counsel, and, and that monitor, monitoring counsel most likely is just your current HOA attorney. That cost really should be fairly minimal because all they're doing is noting things that are happening, making sure that they're copied on reports to the insurance company, reports to the board, uh, and probably the one time that their, their time might become more uh, uh, not substantial but certainly not minimal would be at the point we get into serious settlement discussions or we get close to trial and we want to make sure that that uh, the uh, insurance appointed lawyer really has the association ready for trial. And I'm not implying for one moment that this association in Nevada was not prepared for trial. I'm just saying as a general rule, when my clients have a major claim come in, a major claim of any kind, uh, I always ask the insurance company to keep me to keep me copied and I ask the board to authorize the, the hopefully very minimal expense of just periodically reading the reports. Uh, and then lastly, if the association has a major claim, but the plaintiff's attorney comes in with an opportunity to settle within the policy limits, your monitoring counsel hopefully is jumping up and down and demanding that the insurer protect the association by settling. And if the insurance company doesn't settle, I can only speak to California law, but that insurance company is at its peril if they don't, in California, take a settlement offer that's within policy limits and leave the insured exposed to an excess verdict or an excess judgment against them, then, then we have an issue. Uh, the insurance company may have a problem. So really think, I, I, I know there's going to be a reluctance by boards to spend the money to authorize their counsel to watch those claims, but I, I, I can't tell you how often it has helped my corporate and my HOA clients uh, over the many years. Now, uh, I guess we, uh, Sherry, is this, is this for you, the, the question slide? Yes. I've got, yes, I have uh, several questions that were emailed in. We had some great ones in um, to begin with. Vanessa asks, how does, communication, how does the community association locate a qualified vendor to inspect playground equipment? Yeah, and, and we did touch on this a little bit. Um, Kelly, you had asked, um, there is the Certified Playground Safety Inspector Program through the National Playground uh, or the National Recreation and Park Association. Um, and there are lists of, of CPSI certified folks in your state um, through that, that website. Cheryl asks, or Mark asks, how often do you need to inspect playground equipment? Yes, and I touched on that a little bit in the, the presentation. Um, I think it's most important to um, set an inspection program that works for your playground and your staff and um, takes into consideration all of those things that I was talking about, um, the use the use of your playground, the, the weather and the elements, whether you have um, you know, pests that um, deteriorate your, your playground structures. Um, really, it's going to be unique to each of your um, playground sets, and um, the, the important part is to have an inspection process and a maintenance process in place. Donna asked, what is our liability if someone gets hurt on a playground that hasn't had a maintenance check? Well, again, the, the, the lack of inspection is one possible indicator of a failure of care. Now, then we get into fact issues, but the, the, it's certainly possible that an injury, even with reasonable inspections, might not have been discovered. But I would certainly rather an association be in a position where it can show that it has uh, typically a vendor, somebody qualified to inspect the equipment on a regular basis, and if they miss it, well, there's two possibilities. It may have been so hard to catch that nobody really is at fault, or it may be the inspector's problem. Cheryl asks, what kind of mulch should be used for a tot lot, and how often should it be replaced? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, when you're considering surfacing, it's really important to uh, check with the, the U.S. 
Consumer Safety um, Commission's Public Safety um, Handbook. Uh, there are standards around this. Um, they have very simple calculations that help you understand uh, the best surfacing. And for instance, if you are using um, loose fill in, in a tot lot, um, what depth it should be at um, in order to decrease the chance of serious injury. So the CPSC and the ASTM standards, make sure to check those before you install um, surfacing on your playground. Uh, Mike asks, what steps should a vendor who regularly observes playground equipment but is expressly not performing a safety inspection take or avoid when an obvious hazard is observed? Well, I would say that anybody, a board member, a manager, a vendor who may not be a playground inspector, when we see an obvious hazard, we have a legal and moral responsibility to report it immediately. Uh, and, and, and if I am a vendor and I'm worried about somebody getting injured, I'm also probably going to follow it up with an email or fax documenting that, hey, uh, I just called you. I just alerted you to this. You need to do something right now. Another question from Donna. Are HOA playgrounds considered public playgrounds even though we are members with guests only private HOA? Boy, what a great question. Now, my license is only in California. Some of my other attorneys in the firm have different states. But I can tell you that in California, Playgrounds are considered by the Health and Safety Code as public, even though it's a completely gated security community, uh, as are swimming pools. They are considered public for the purpose of the application of California's playground safety law. So the fact that you're a gated community or even a security building does not mean that you don't have to pay attention to state laws and regulations. And I would strongly suggest that in your state's jurisdictions, wherever you're listening from today, check with your counsel and make sure that you know if these standards apply. Also another question, do we need to create a maintenance plan for all playground equipment? I'll take that one, Kelly. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, all, all equipment should be inspected and maintained regularly. We obviously first recommend that you check those, those manufacturer's guidelines for the specific pieces of equipment. But as I, I mentioned in the, um, in the webinar earlier, there's all kinds of other things that can impact how often you inspect. Things like the weather, things like um, pests and all those types of things. And you want to take all those things into consideration when creating your maintenance plan and make sure that it's unique and feasible for, um, for your playground in, in setting a best practice for you. And our final question is, what do, we need, what do we need to know before adding a new play structure or element to existing play areas? Yeah, and I'll, I'll take that one. I, I, I can't um, overstate the importance of knowing the CPSC guidelines, the ASTM standards, and referencing that um, material from your manufacturers and your installers. Always go back to that to, to start um, understanding what is needed for your play areas. And in, in my state in California, you're going to have to have one of those inspections to start off under the Health and Safety Code. Well, as, as we wrap up, uh, one of the things that Sally and I wanted to emphasize is that, that in dealing with this, this issue, we really have to have a paradigm shift in how we think about play equipment. You know, we managers and HOA attorneys spend a lot of time dealing with uh, maintenance and failure of balconies and roofs and balcony railings and plumbing and things typically that deal with water. But most of those are, are more passive deterioration uh, issues. Here with play equipment, we're dealing with actively abused items, items that are designed to take abuse, that are designed to be pulled and pushed and swung and jumped on. And it's amazing to me that we don't spend actually a greater amount of time than we do. And I, and I will tell you, I have to confess that this has woken me up as well. This disaster in Las Vegas and this terrible thing that happened to this young man made me realize that I also need to be putting much greater emphasis on these equipment items that are abused by their design. They're designed to be attacked and, and that we have to be much more careful with them to take care of them because it's these little ones in the slide that we're trying to protect at the end of the day. It's not just a financial issue. There are people affected. And these particular people, and since Sally and I created the, the seminar, uh, we'd like you to meet uh, Jack Richardson on the left, 
and little Harbor Wood in the middle. Those are my two grandsons. And on the right, Sally, do you know those two? Yeah, Violet and Desmond Wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about, folks, is taking care of each other and taking care of our little treasures, whether they're our kids or our grandkids or somebody else's kids or grandkids. We just have to think a little bit more deeply on this issue and spend a little bit more time and, yes, spend a little bit more money uh, to take care of these folks. And at the end of the day, everybody's better off. And with that, we must conclude.